made it. It was hard, but we made it. I don't know, Siona. We barely made it through that one. I feel powerless. Whoa, whoa. Careful there. Look. It's there. The Temple of Valor. We made it. <gasps> we did. Whoa. Hold on to me. I'll transform into a horse so we can get there faster. Victor, you're back. Victor? Ah, greetings. Uh, travelers, the winds of fate have brought you here. Hello. We came here to... We are... We... Lovette! Wake up, Lovette! Please, please, is there anything you can do? Uh, help me get her inside. Hello, are you... Siona? Lovette was calling your name while she was asleep. I should go and check on her. We better let her rest. She seems pretty exhausted. Don't worry. There are people who are taking care of her. Why don't you join me for a walk till she wakes up? Um, all right. So, Siona, tell me about the lands you hail from. I come from a faraway forest, a place of ancient magic. But Lovette and I, we've been through a lot lately. Hmm. Journeys often reveal more than just material landscapes. What burdens your heart? Lovette's been tormented by nightmares. She's exhausted, drained. It's affecting her in battles, in life. Hmm. Nightmares. Like storm clouds cast shadows upon the spirit. Have you uncovered the source of her troubled dreams? Not yet. They've been haunting her for too long. I fear she's drowning in them. Hmm, I see. Can you help her? Hmm, the waters of Valor run deep. And within them, we may find clarity. Tomorrow, I shall guide her through the currents of her dreams. But Lovette must be open to this journey as well. It requires her willingness to confront the shadows that haunt her slumber. Rest assured, we will do what we can to bring her peace. I'll be forever grateful. Um... It's Kai. And what about you, Siona? Do you feel well? I feel a... a disharmony inside of you. Um, I don't know what you're talking about. I feel... fine. Hmm, is Lovette the only reason you came to this temple? Lovette is my priority now. The rest can wait. I understand. Well, till she wakes up, let me show you the Temple of Valor. Shall we? This is the Mnemonic Mirage. Mnemonic Mirage? A place where the waters hold the echoes of memories. Each ripple carries the reflections of one's past, a canvas upon which we can learn from our experiences. It's beautiful. This is the one Lovette is going to use. Yes, and not only that. Ah, over there is the Silk Serenity, a meditation terrain. The sand reflects the tranquility of one's mind. The calmer your thoughts, the straighter the sand remains around you. That's lovely. Can anyone use it? Ah, oh, absolutely. It's open for everyone seeking mental clarity. Whoa. What is that bridge over there, between the two mountains? Hmm, you have a good eye, Siona. That is the windswept airy. An ethereal air bridge suspended between the mountains above the clouds. 
As seekers embark on their meditative journey, they find themselves elevated, both physically and spiritually above the mundane concerns of the world. It looks really high. That's what makes the finish line even more valuable. Oof, it's getting warmer here, isn't it? Yes, that's because we are close to the Ember Inferno, the last terrain of the Four Elements. The flames... Um, I think we're done here. I, if, if you don't mind, let's go back to Levet. Uh, oh, Siona? Siona? Don't worry, traveler. You're safe. Who are you? I'm Sister Hua Li. You're at the Temple of Valor. Valor? That means we made it. I need to find Siona. You will. In time. But you need to rest first, hmm? It seems your mind is exhausting you. I can't just rest here. Siona needs me. We barely made it through that fight. Your friend is safe. She's being taken care of by our brother Kai. They're exploring the temple grounds as we speak. But uh, I still feel like I should be doing something. Sometimes the most important thing we can do is take care of ourselves. Hmm? Now, why don't you tell me about these dreams you've been having while I'm making us some tea? She told you. They're... They're awful. I see my home, my mother, my friends, my beloved, but there's darkness and I can't reach them. Always the same scene playing in my mind. The person who sent me away from them. His memory. My last memory of my world and it's haunting me. I feel so helpless. It sounds like you're carrying a heavy burden, Lovette. What else troubles you? It's... It's hard to talk about. I've always felt like I didn't quite belong, you know? Like there's this emptiness inside me, and then... The missing father I've been trying to reach for years since he left me? Turns out he's not even my real father. And who am I? I have no idea. It's like the ground was pulled out from under me. Hmm. You know, in brewing tea, as in life, it's the careful balance of elements that creates harmony. The right amount of leaves, the perfect temperature, and time. They all contribute to the essence of the tea. Similarly, seeking balance in our own lives requires the right mix of introspection, connection, and time. Just as the tea leaves release their flavors and aromas, so too can we reveal our true selves when we allow the right elements to come together. The path of self-discovery can be challenging and full of uncertainties, but it is not a journey you have to undertake alone. Sometimes, the strength lies in recognizing that it's okay not to have all the answers, Seeking help is not a sign of weakness, but a courageous step toward understanding oneself. You have people here who care about you, ready to support you on this journey. And maybe these people are your right elements. Hmm? Here you are. Thank you. Sister? Hmm? I need help. Welcome again to another episode of the B&D Podcast. 
and what an episode is going to be because today we've got an absolutely special treat for you a topic close to our hearts mental health and the magical world of dungeons and dragons that's right today we're joined by the amazing dr megan a connell as a licensed psychologist author and dedicated player of D&D, we immediately knew she would be the perfect guide to help us navigate the intricate pathways of mental health within our beloved game. So let's give her a warm welcome. Dr. Megan, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. It's our honor to have you here, actually. <laughs> and we're, we're so, so looking grateful. forward uh, to this interview. But before we dive into our discussion, I want to make a special shout out and give my warmest thanks to the talented voice actors who have participated in today's intro. Two inspiring and talented people who graced us with their voice. So a shout out to Andrea Guidry, who gave her unique voice to the monk Hua Li, and she is officially the Uncle Iroh of our story. And Christian Lidley, who gives an amazing performance as Kai, giving his tranquil voice. It was definitely one of the best and inspiring intros I got to edit till now. So thank you so much for your contribution. And you guys stay tuned because the story of Valor has just begun and you listen to them a lot for the next few episodes. You will find more info about them down in the description box. So go and check them out. I'm going to start with the first question. Um, consider us and our listeners curious. Could you share a bit about your background and how you got interested in both psychology and Dungeons and Dragons? Yeah, so uh, D&D, like um, a lot of us, I started playing in middle school. Uh, this was in ye olden times before printers and things like D&D Beyond or digital character sheets were around. So we would have to use, you know, our notebook paper to create our character sheets and hand write out things. Uh, there wasn't much playing. It was mostly just character creation and rolling dice to make new characters. Uh, fell away from the hobby for many, many years, uh, became a psychologist. Um, I started off my journey to psychology through the realm of music therapy. Uh, I am a very, very bad guitar player. That is not me <laughs> being like modest. That's that is like I had my uh, <laughs> department chair to set me aside and said I either needed to take a year off to really get good at the guitar or change my major <laughs> <laughs> towards the end of my uh, undergrad. So I decided to change my major. Um because I was planning on going on to become a psychologist anyway at that point, because I love just love helping people and hearing stories and helping people see their stories in different ways. Not mm -hmm. an active bard then. <laughs> no, no, I still love music. I still love storytelling. Um, okay. And I, I love playing and singing. It's just uh, I have some atypicalities in my brain that cause rhythm to not really work, uh, okay. which if you're trying to be a professional musician does not work very well. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, so then I uh, became a psychologist. I was in the army and then uh, was watching YouTube one day and uh, stumbled across Will Wheaton's uh, Ashes of Val Valhalla, Valhalla. Uh, the fantasy age uh, live play that he did on Geek and Sundry and was very into it because I was like, man, I love I love D&D &D as a kid. That was so much fun. And then I started watching Critical Role, got back into playing and uh, joined a random group of people on Roll20 for a weekly game and just fell back in love with playing. And it was through playing that I kind of recognized I started learning some things about myself and I recognized too that I would not have learned those things about myself were it not for the game because I was so defensive about them that in regular therapy they really would not have popped out and so that was where I was like I need to use this this is a very very powerful tool and I happened to hear another podcast interview of another psychologist who was using D&D &D specifically to teach social skills and uh, he and I connected and are good friends now, actually, and uh, have kind of been trailblazing this path uh, along with a few others. OK, that's so great because we also felt that um, we also see parts of ourselves through our characters. So I think mm -hmm. it's very amazing what you're doing. Yeah, it was with my own characters. I was looking at the two characters that I have been playing because I, I was house cleaning one day and, you know, that's not fun. So my brain was wandering <laughs> and uh, Daydreaming. I was like, OK, I there's these two characters that I have. They both came from my brain. They have to have things in common. And when I realized the things they had in common, I had this. Have you ever had that thing where you realize like you screwed up or something? It feels like the bottom just falls out from under you. Yeah. I, I had that feeling where I was like, oh, that's my issue. <laughs> and that's where I was like, this is so powerful. I, I need to use this. Um, And I, I found a quick workaround from this where you don't have to daydream for hours, which is build a party that is nothing but your previous 
player characters Mm -hmm. and the issues that they're all having are your issues. It's like, it's very funny when I ask that question or bring that scenario up when I'm giving talks at conventions, the groans in the audience and just little (laughs) chuckles that they have and kind of like getting wide eyed and be like, yep, yep. That's, that's what I need to work on right there. So you found it it. is actually, it is actually a way of healing to create characters with our issues. It's just the way of heal a healing process for people somehow. I don't know that it's a healing process in an like a deliberate way so much as like the things we need to address or our base insecurities kind of can't help but show up. It, it's sort of like when you have implicit biases towards something because it's implicit, you're not aware that you're bringing it into the world. And so the same thing, like if we have implicit insecurities or, you know, character flaws or things like that, they're going to just kind of show up kind of no matter what we do, because It's just in our understanding of what the world is like. If you are a person who believes at the end of the day, everybody is just out to take care of themselves. Well, you're going to create a character that has only interacted with people like that. And those kinds of issues are going to be popping up for for that character. It is really powerful. And I wanted to ask as well, in your experience, what specific mental health benefits can individuals gain from playing Dungeons and Dragons? It's a that's a hard question. It's a great question. It's also a very hard one. So uh, in my book, Tabletop Role Playing Therapy, uh, I address this often is that we don't have research. We need research on the therapeutic benefits of D&D. It looks like you can treat pretty much any diagnoses through using applied gaming. But we just don't know because we don't have research on it. You know, for example, somebody with high anxiety, we can teach, you know, ways to engage the parasympathetic nervous system through deep breathing, muscle relaxation, things like that. And we can present opportunities in the game to feel stressed out and then to talk themselves through how to calm down and to practice calming down. You know, we can give incentives for uh, folks with ADHD to utilize some of their coping strategies and quiet fidgets and things like that through giving inspiration dice and other things to reinforce the behaviors we want to see. Uh, For folks with depression, just kind of coming to the group, connecting with people can be very helpful. You know, there's a lot of that of things that we can see that look like it really should directly benefit a wide array of diagnoses. But unfortunately, we just don't have the research for it yet. Um, Hopefully we will, um, but it is very behind where it should be. I think it is also very important that you play with friends and uh, you get to know uh, new people. And to be honest, D&D came to my rescue during a really tough time in my life. Some folks uh, might not believe it, but it's true. Um, Having that weekly game with my friends, spending time with them and diving into our character's world for a few hours was like a breath um, of fresh air. And it allowed me to leave behind those dark thoughts for a while. And you know what? Creating the story together, it felt like we were weaving something magical. So... I don't know. It was therapeutic for me. Well, and there's something very powerful in having problems that can be solved. I I think like there's an existential dread that a lot of people are feeling these days. I'm Mm -hmm. still a psychologist in practice. I still work with a lot of clients. And something I'm noting over the last five or six years is more and more teenagers are having a very just hopeless look on life. Um, Not necessarily like themselves, like Their self-esteem can be very good. They can feel very competent and able to function in their lives. But their hope that they're going to be able to be successful in the world and things like that is, you know, quite far down. And so, you know, it's not so much a thing of there's no hope in the world. There certainly is a lot of hope, but like it feels like we can't do anything about it. And then when you go and you play D&D where, you know, your character can go and talk to a literal god to try to get them (laughs) to help out or to give you a tool that so that you can solve a problem. It's really nice. And like in our own lives, it is that kind of breath of fresh air. It's like that equivalent of you know, going and taking a shower when you've got a really big problem you're trying to solve and giving your brain a quick break from it so that you can have those kind of little aha and insight moments. You know, and the other big thing with tabletop role playing therapy and applied therapy in this way is that you're practicing skills. You know, we're, uh, I'm going to tell on us before, you know, we were joking before the recording started that, um, we're going to be all fighting for, you know, who has the lowest charisma score, but you know, (laughs) charisma and, you know, interpersonal dynamics and things come from practice. The more you practice, the more you can level up those skills. And so playing a role playing game where there's no real world consequences, if you really screw up how you talk to somebody, 
you know, like if you come into the tavern and you're very rude, you know, as a game master, I can kind of pause the game and be like, hey, do you realize what you've done here? Do you realize how you're coming off? Do you realize what you're saying? That can really help players kind of get some insight into their own behaviors and their own actions. So that's an incredibly powerful tool that we can utilize. And we know that role playing is helpful. That's been well documented and well researched in psychology. Like and, a safety oh, net. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and something interesting is like as much as we know role playing helps, it's also one of the things people don't want to do. Um, I and I'm guessing like you all have probably had the experience where you're in a class or something like that. And it's like, okay, so we need somebody to be this person who wants to pretend to be this, or let's role play you saying no to drugs or or, or something along those lines. Nobody wants to role play themselves in a situation. Like that's it's very awkward. It's not fun. But be like, okay, so you're going to be, you know, Thrumbar the Barbarian and you need to stand up for yourself and your friends right here. You know, that's incredibly powerful. That's so true. Um, You mentioned about uh, your book, uh, Tabletop Mm -hmm. Role Playing Therapy, a guide for the clinical game master. Could you tell us more about your book? You know, uh, what readers can expect to gain from it by reading it? Yeah. So the book is split into two halves. It's actually the first book published on tabletop role playing uh, therapy. And the first half is to go into the kind of foundational principles and guiding ideas behind utilizing games such as Dungeons and Dragons, Pathfinder, Kids on Bikes, all of those as a tool for uh, therapy. And so looking at the foundational research, we're looking at what diagnoses can be benefited from, why it is that we think these games make us feel so much. And then the second half is uh, more geared towards clinicians if they want to develop Um, their skills and be able to run games in a therapeutic way. And so it's sort of this how-to guide from identifying your target you know, population to getting referrals to your documentation, look through the ethics, session planning, all of those things. I've read that uh, you have played with uh, girls. Yeah, the therapeutic groups I run are specifically for women and girls. Uh, and we focus on assertiveness training, building strong relationships and creative problem solving all together. Um, there's a lot of research uh, from in you know, feminist theory that women, we tend to treat each other very badly. And that's not a biological thing. That is something that is taught. Uh, if you've ever seen like the, the Queen Bees and Wannabes uh, book uh, theory, this is actually what um, Mean Girls is based off of is the Queen Bees mm-hmm. and Wannabes book. Uh, it's this idea that there's one girl who gets to have all the power and all the other girls are just wanting to be her. And that's not accurate. That's what's taught by our culture. And so teaching young women how to stand up for themselves, teaching them to find their voice, teaching them to say no, uh, how to set a boundary firmly, but respectfully, you know, it, it it's a very powerful tool. And it, it is a lot of fun to do that. So important indeed. That sounds really interesting. And I can't wait to read this book. <laughs> Dr. Megan, though, can you tell us, are there specific moments or experiences shared in the book that stand out to you as particularly impactful or inspiring? So for confidentiality reasons, I couldn't use any real stories in the book. I could kind of allude to some things that had been said, but I couldn't use anybody's stories. Um, just even if the the client had given permission, like the Norton didn't want to do that. So I kind of had to make up a lot of things. Um, but I will say like there's one of the things I'm very proud of that did get into the book that I think is important is I have an appendices in there is that all of these research questions that really need to be answered. It's basically, I think, like 10 or 15 doctoral level thesis questions that could be done. But there's a lot of stories that I've had in, you know, running these games. And like a couple of the powerful ones is like um, one of my players being able to say no to their friends for the first time and not in a way of being mean, but just like, no, I don't feel like doing that. So no, a boundary, (laughs) Um, setting a boundary and and is one of the first times they had done that. And and like is just so powerful to see. And another one was I had one client who was on the autism spectrum. And one of the issues with folks with autism is difficulty with perspective taking. Um, So essentially, like folks on the autism spectrum tend to have this idea that if I know and understand something, everybody else has to know and understand it. And they only look through their own perspective and very broad strokes. This is something that definitely can be taught. It is a skill. It is learnable. And it it can just be a little bit hard. And I was running a game and everybody was doing things that they wanted to do. And I was kind of breaking down what the situation was. And I had one kid kind of look and go, oh my gosh, I'm supposed to be doing what my character would want me to do, not what I 
want to do. And that was another powerful moment where I'm like, all right, this is, we got something here. There's something to utilizing this game as a tool for therapy. I do hope that more people learn about this subject and maybe start a research about this because it is really important to have. But I also like to ask, how do you navigate the balance between facilitating a D&D game and maintaining a therapeutic environment? It, it can be a little bit difficult. It's about how you approach it. Um, so what I do with my groups is I think about what they could benefit most from in play. And it's it's sort of like juggling, I think would be a way to think about it, is looking at what are the goal, stated goals for the group? What are the players' stated goals for their characters? And what am I observing happening in the room? And how do I create situations that are going to allow for those three things to be addressed? So in a typical campaign, I would have the people together and, you know, I'd be reading the dynamic in the room and be like, oh, man, this group needs to learn how to mesh together. Let me put a couple of scenarios in front of them to help them with that. But with this, it's like, I need them to mesh together. I need them to stand up for themselves. I need them to learn how to practice trusting one another, asserting their boundaries, and, you know, prioritizing their own self-care over helping everybody else, right? It's like, what encounter is going to do that? It's really challenging to be thinking about those things. And so it's trying to figure out what's going to be best and also to make, make sure it stays fun. Because if the game isn't fun, it's not good. And so trying to create NPCs that can pull the players into the world of the game to get them to engage more, because if they're engaging, then, you know, the chances of therapeutic intervention sticking are, hope I think, increased. And so there's just a lot to go on. One of the things that I will do is I will at times uh, pause the game. So I'll put down the Dungeon Master screen and we'll process what's going on to talk through what's going on and to help the players kind of think through what they want to do. And then we, I really like to utilize in versus out of character discussions because it can be incredibly helpful to have people talk out of character and to talk through what their character is thinking and to gain those insights into what's going on. Um, but there's just a lot that is happening at the table, even if we're not adding the layer of therapy to it. And so being able to balance all of that and manage all of it is very difficult. About that, Val is involved in a library program that introduces Dungeons and Dragons to young adults, ages 11 to 17. Do you have any advice for creating a welcoming and inclusive D&D environment for young players in a library setting? I, I think being approachable and open to feedback is really important. Mm -hmm. um, you want to utilize safety tools. And when we're talking about safety tools in terms of games like D&D &D or Pathfinder, it's about people being able to state their boundaries of what's okay and what's not okay. Um, there's a new product out there that I absolutely love. I don't get any kickback from them, but it's called the, the Deck of Player Safety. And for one-shot campaigns or just really short campaigns, it's a great tool to be able to establish boundaries and help with world building. Uh, it's a deck of cards. And what you do is you split it up evenly amongst all the players and each player gets an envelope. And they look through the cards that they're given and they have to pull at least one card out, and then they pass the deck on to the left until everybody's had the entire deck. And the cards that they put in the envelope are their no-go topics. And then they pass the envelopes up to the game master, who takes out all the cards, shuffles them, and then lays them out on the table. So we have no idea who put what into the envelope. Um, there's a lot of cards that say anything goes or are blank. Um, and so like, if you're fine and don't you're not worried about stuff, um, you can utilize that. And having that is a really powerful tool just to let people know, like, okay, I have, you know, I'm afraid of spiders. I don't want spiders to be in the campaign. It's like, okay, cool, done. That's not going to be there. Um, and then also just having clear rules and expectations, especially if there's any folks who are on the autism spectrum, knowing what behaviors are expected helps to reduce anxiety significantly, which will increase engagement. And so just being very clear on what time do we start? What does that mean? Is if we're saying we start at 7 p.m., does that mean I walk in the door at 7 p.m.? Or does that mean I'm at my chair with my dice ready to go at 7 p.m.? If there's uh, a disagreement at the table, how do we handle that? If there are conflicts, what's done about that? What rules are we following? What are our house rules? And just having that stuff be very clear and out there and be willing to check in a few times. You know, we I talk about session zero a lot and the importance of session zero, which is where we lay all this foundational work. But then like you want to revisit session zero every now and then. And so just kind of popping in and going, OK, so 
we've played three, four sessions. How's it feeling to everybody? What do you want to do? Anything we want to change? And then we kind of move forward with that. Thank you so much for your advice. I'm going to have to look into that deck. It's such a clever idea. It's really cool. The, and the people who made it are absolutely lovely and very, very open to feedback. Like they have a card in there that's no harm to animals. But I've run into some problems with that where it's like, wait, does this mean any animal? So like we can't have dire wolves attack the party and morgues? <laughs> Or, but for most people, it's domesticated animals. No harm to cats or dogs or horses and donkeys. It's like, okay, that's that's doable. So um, another thing, there might be some skepticism or misunderstanding around using d d in therapy. How do you address or combat any potential stigma? It's a really big challenge. Um, so one of the reasons we don't have a lot of research on tabletop games in therapy is because in the 1980s, we had the satanic panic where there was all that fear that playing Dungeons and Dragons was going to lead you to the occult and cause you to kill yourself if your character died, which all is incredibly untrue. <laughs> um, no, none of that is founded. There was not anything that any of the claims were being made back then were accurate. But that stigma still holds true and we're still suffering the ramifications from that today. And so, you know, if people have challenges to it, if they're, you know, worried about it, it, it listening to what the concerns are and talking through it, not in a way of like, well, you're wrong, right? It's, mm -hmm. You know, if one of the interesting stigmas that we run into as therapists is we don't have permission to play by society. Um there's this one research study that I love. I think Dietering is the author of it uh, called Alibis in Play. And one of the challenges in there is that the more highly educated and the more authority you have, the more frowned upon it is for you to play. And so in I've had a couple or actually, no, just one therapist reached out to me wanting to utilize tabletop role playing therapy, but they were like, under no circumstances will I actually play. And I was like, under no circumstances should you use this tool? Because if you can't get in there and play, if you can't get in there and model doing silly voices, doing bad accents, fubbing roles, like playing with the players, it's not going to work. And so this idea that play is something just for children and, and that play and game, games and gaming is juvenile is probably one of the bigger challenges that we have. You know, like the American Psychological Association, I... I I think they actually might be a little bit more open and amicable to gaming as a form of therapy. But historically, anything geek related, gaming related, it, they've just kind of turned, you know, looked down their noses on. And so, like, I just haven't been interested. Um, a graduate student that I know, he actually did a study on this. And it was very funny because he like all of us kind of had this idea that big psychological authorities wouldn't really care support what we did. And his read of his research was he kind of found that that was not true. But my read of it was all the people that he interviewed have kind of had the same idea. And so they just didn't engage. It's so he didn't find any bad experiences because we were like, well, I don't think I'm welcome here. So I'm just not going to go there. And so I think that's one of the biggest stigmas that we have is this, you know, the scientific academic body looks down on play and it looks down on fun. And that's a really big challenge if you're trying to get some research done and get something that you do taken seriously so that you can help more people. Especially for kids. And yes, fun and play, it's very important for them. Well, and that's the thing is they'll say, okay, for play therapy, for 10 and under, this is great. But don't talk about playing with teenagers. That's just weird. No, it's not. <laughs> it's not even for us. 30 years old. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, yeah. And that's the other thing to donate, you know, and it's like, oh, what about adults? Adults don't play. It's like, are you kidding me? Like adults love this game and it is so powerful and so much fun. And like, it can be a really amazing tool. We just got to be willing to actually play. And by the way, that idea that adults don't play is utter baloney. If you go into gaming studies at all, when you look at anthropology, what, there's some defining things that all cultures have. All cultures have games. Every culture has gaming. So, it, you know, if you just look back, you're going to find what games have been played for thousands of years by humans. And there are dozens of them because gaming and sports as well are parts of being human. And that means something, I guess. Yes. <laughs> and I really hope the stigma is going to be eliminated soon. <laughs> I also wanted to ask Dr. Uh, Megan, can you share mm -hmm. a success story where D&D &D played a crucial role in someone's therapeutic journey? I alluded to it before, the person saying no. 
-hmm. Like that was such a big turning point for them of being able to say no. One of my groups too, we had a player who was very over apologetic. It was very interesting because like the group loved and cared for one another. And they started doing this loving thing of like, you get one, uh, what they called illegitimate sorry, where you're saying sorry and you don't need to. And then if you do more than one, we're going to start chucking D6s at you. And uh, it was very funny because over the course of a year playing together, um, that player went from almost every other word being sorry to pretty much only saying it when actually appropriate. And they had an experience of another player joining the group who was an over apologizer and recognizing how far they had come in that regard. And be like, oh, my gosh, that's how I used to be. And now look at where I am. So they recognize it for themselves, too. Yes. Uh, Because that was the next question. How do players typically react to the integration of therapeutic elements into the game? It's so funny because I don't think a lot of times they realize it. Okay. You know, I, I it's sort of like stealthy therapy. Like um, I had uh, another player who had a very hard time standing up to authority. And so I created an incredibly frustrating scene where um, this is a, a good DM pro tip. If you want to frustrate and uh, exacerbate your players, have them go have to go up a wizard's tower that is 10 levels. But uh each level is only a series of buttons. And depending on the bu- what button they push, they either get a ladder or the floor falls out from under them and they fall back down several levels, um, uh, which is shoots and ladders or snakes and ladders, uh, depending on which version you're familiar with. And it will get them incredibly frustrated because there's no rhyme or reason to that board. It's silly. And uh, I feel frustrated uh, by hearing. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, and then to the icing on top was like all the players needed to do is they needed to talk to the wizard and just say, hey, can you please stop picking this one particular plant? It's of cultural importance to the people here. And I just had this wizard not care at so indifferent. So just like, Pat, like, whatever, I don't care about you guys. Why are you here? Stop wasting my time. And this player got up in my face and was pointing and yelling at me as as I was role playing the wizard. And like, finally, like got to a point where they were able to ne- negotiate a favorable outcome. And I paused the game and I looked at the person I'm like, hey, you just yelled at somebody. And I'm like, well, no, I didn't. That was my character. It's like, yeah, but that was you. You yelled and the world didn't end. And it, it was very fascinating. Like they had this moment of like kind of sitting down and be like, oh, my God, I can yell at people. And so it, it's this really interesting thing of like not even realizing what they're doing. That sounds and, like, so great and amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's cool, too, because like one of the things that is a skill for therapists you know, some friends who maybe have a therapeutic brain but aren't fully trained is that ability to see growth. You know, like there can be times where you do something that's really challenging for you. And just because it's not challenging for other people, we tend to dismiss it, right? Like um, I'm thinking of like, I've worked with a number of clients who are going through significant life changes, whether that be, you know, the death of somebody they love, a divorce, something along those lines. Mm-hmm. And like, they still show up into my office and they're like, oh, I'm sorry, you know, like they're there and they're a little like flustered and like, oh, I didn't do my therapy homework. It's like, dude, you showed up. You are like, Nobody would blame you if you just sat in your bed all day being miserable, but you got up, you took a shower, you put on clean clothes, you drove here, you showed up like that was a monumental challenge for you. And I can see the monumental challenge, and the effort you put into that. And so being able to see the growth that people have and being able to reflect that back is incredibly powerful for folks. Damn, I feel inspired now. (laughs) And what advice would you give to players who are looking to use D&D as a form of self-care or personal growth? First off, don't have your dungeon master who is your friend be your therapist. That is inappropriate. (laughs) Therapists are there for a reason. Um, If you want to join a group that is doing tabletop role-playing therapy, uh, you can search it. There's different groups. There's some people who do it online. Um, I did during the pandemic. I don't anymore because I prefer running the group face to face. Um, But there's a number of centers out there that are doing it nationally and internationally online. And so that can be a helpful thing. If you're just wanting to utilize tabletop role playing games to help you, um, I don't know, be more, oh, let's go back to our charisma talk, right? To be a little bit more charismatic, you know, work on that, build a high charisma character and actually try to role play them having charisma. It's amazing the skills that we get. Um, In my book, I call it emotional permeability. The term from LARPing is called bleed. Um, I changed it to a more 
long term in my book, because when I'm doing documentation writing, there was a lot of amazing bleed that happened tonight um, in a therapy note doesn't look good. <laughs> um, and so finding more clinical terms, I think could be helpful. But the, that idea of playing a character and role playing it and just getting some practice at being suave and then just even having that different frame, being able to say like, well, me, the human, I'm not good at this, but man, my bard would kick butt here. What would my bard do? How would my bard finagle this situation? What opportunities would my bard see that me as the human, I can't see? And that's just absolutely fascinating to see. And it's a really interesting way that we can grow and we can develop ourselves in a way that's not inappropriate for our game masters. Yeah, of course. I also wanted to know, um, for dungeon masters interested in creating therapeutic campaigns, are there specific considerations they should um, keep in mind? Well, so this is one of those things of like, don't do stuff without training. Um, there are plenty of courses. I helped to develop the training through uh, Leyline Geek Therapeutics. Uh, and it does a wonderful job of giving both instruction and then practical practice and having connections with other people that you can consult with. Um, if you are not a licensed therapist or have training in being a licensed therapist, don't try to run therapeutic games. Um, if you are curious about it, you can learn about it. You don't necessarily have to be a therapist just to run the games, though, but as long as you're working with a therapist, because there are a number of folks who are not licensed clinicians that are game mastering, but they are working with a licensed clinician who is also part of the group. And so it, getting training is the number one thing. My book's a great place to start, but not to finish. <laughs> uh, you know, continue on, consult with other people, talk with folks. When I started this journey, um, I didn't have the opportunity to consult with many folks, but I did consult with a few of us that were utilizing tabletop role playing therapy and, you know, talking to one another. Um, so we consulted, but we didn't have the resources that we have now. You know, it's a lot of the book is built on, I made these mistakes so you don't have to <laughs> kinds of things. That is really good to know. And what you've been doing is amazing. And we're really hopeful for the future. But where do you see the intersection of D&D &D and therapy heading in the future? My hope is that it can be something that is well-researched and becomes uh, something that is trained in graduate schools and becomes just sort of an accepted form of therapy, that it can be very well well done and well-documented and utilized because it is just such a powerful tool that can be used. Oftentimes, like we just, I don't know, we tend to poo-poo on things, but, you know, play therapy is now taught in grad schools. You know, it's not an required course. It's an optional course, but there is a lot of training that you can do. And so that's where I really hope to see it go. Are there any developments, projects or ideas of yours or others uh, you're excited about uh, in this sector? Lots. Um, with the integration of technology, there is just a lot that we can do with things. I mean, obviously you don't need tech to run D&D &D or other tabletop games. You just need your imagination and dice or some other randomizer. But my uh, my business partner is very into VR and what we're trying to experiment with is doing some sort of combination of virtual and alternative reality where you have some people that are sitting around a table and other people that are plugged in VR and are able to still virtually be at the table and to see the maps and to utilize things like Dungeon Alchemist to create the really immersive, beautiful maps that you can look top down, but also place your mini on and see the view from your mini's perspective. It's just, um, there's a lot of really cool things that we can do that I think are going to really open it up to some really cool places, I think. That's I volunteer so a stream yeah. for that. We are. <laughs> <laughs> we can play with Val because she's in Scotland. So that would be a lot, a huge help. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be a lot of fun. I mean, like my weekly game that I just play for fun with my friends, uh, we play through, you know, video chat. We started on Skype and now we're on Discord. And, and it's fun. It works great. You know, some of us are on video, some of us are audio only, but like we've been friends for so long now through this game. And so it can be played very effectively. But I think there is sort of that cool factor of being able to feel connected and to actually feel like you're there. And, and like the problem with, you know, the window box in a Zoom call or a Discord call or something like that 
is you're only seeing a very small portion of the person's body. And for especially for folks who are trying to learn improved social skills, it takes away a lot of what we're trying to teach. You know, it's like we're trying to show the body language, how you orient your shoulders, what you're doing with your back, what you're doing with your posture. Those are all really important nonverbals that we lose in video. And so if we could have a VR system where we see avatars that are mimicking full bodies, that could be incredibly powerful for folks. That's true. Body language is very important too. Yes. So, okay, I think it is a good time to be geekier now and talk about all things nerdy, because as we've mentioned before, you're not only a doctor, but a player too, who enjoys playing yes. this game. So, who is your all-time favorite D&D character that you've played, and what made them so special to you? Oh, uh, that's going to be Torina, my bard, dra a silver dragonborn bard. Um, she's a punk rock person. Oh. Uh, she, she's wonderful. Uh, part of what I love about her is she went to level 20, um... And so she was a bard lock. So she had two levels of warlock or three levels of warlock. And just she was so fun to play. Like having an 18 bonus on like all of my uh, charisma checks was just amazing. Um, and, she and had a the, really cool art. All the magical yeah. secrets you have. Oh, on yes. Level oh, my God. That's amazing. <laughs> it was so fun. It was so fun to play her. Um, I'm liking my new Drew. I'm uh, in two, we're doing two campaigns right now because our main dungeon master just ha his wife just had a baby, so uh, he's taking a break from dungeon mastering for a little while. But uh, we're playing Descent into Avernus, and I'm playing a um, Triton who is a combination uh, bard and uh, rogue, so swashbuckler rogue and College of Swords bards, and she's so fun. She's so fun too. I'm really liking her because she. Uh, She's based off of the pirate Grace O'Malley, if you are familiar with her. If not, look her up. She's amazing. Uh, she was hunted by Queen Elizabeth I, and she got really sick of it. And she actually went to Queen Elizabeth herself and was like, can you please stop? This is ridiculous. <laughs> and like, yeah, she just, she always would, when she had somebody, her question was like, mm, who does that person work for? I'm going to go talk to that person. <laughs> and so like, that is just such a fun vibe to bring into Descent to Avernus. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Amazing. Can you also share a memorable uh, story from your early days of playing D anD D, whether as a player or a dungeon master? Um, very. So I'm going to go back to middle school because, like, I think one of my favorite things. Uh, I don't remember what version of D anD D we were playing. I didn't have any of the books. I just did what my friends were telling me to do with making my characters and things. <laughs> but we started making our own spells, and all of us were very into Monty Python. And so somebody invented the spam spell. Spam? And uh, yep, it, it was a I, I forget what type of magic attack it was, but if it reduced the person to zero hit points, they turned into uh, canned spam. And it, if they were a small creature, it was like four cans of spam. Like, oh so we would get food yeah, we'd get food <laughs> rations for killing people with that spell. <laughs> <laughs> but it was spam, so it made you a little sad. <laughs> well, uh, in the vast array of D&D classes and races, uh, which combination is your go-to when creating a new character? Oh, I, I'm so basic. I, I love elves. I, I've been playing a lot of Baldur's Gate, and I keep going back to elves. Um, in part because like, the Dark Vision thing is really cool, and that's really fun. Um, and I I was grew up on reading t the Tolkien books and was a huge Legolas fan, so like I don't think I ever truly grew out of that. But yeah, and and Bard is still my favorite class because like you can do so much with it, which I think is phenomenal. Like you can be a very big heavy caster, or you can go let you know like doing something like College of Swords where it's more light, being more of a historian. Like they they're just it is such a versatile class to make it the way you would like. Uh, that I really enjoy that a lot. We are spiritually aligned because I agree. <laughs> I can bard. agree more for the elves as well. <laughs> oh, yes. And I also play a bard. <laughs> Lovet is a bard. So, yeah, the half elf elf thing with the bards and the, all this stuff, mm -hmm. you know, they got my heart. <laughs> I haven't if played I... the bards. Oh, you got to play bards. I will say also, like, I like doing some of the small classes and doing a really kind of weird combination with like making halfling barbarians oh or I love gnomish monks. <laughs> halfling barbarians are so fun. It's, I don't like the idea of a three foot tall person who can punch you into tomorrow <laughs> is just that is so fun. And it their is weapon so is bigger than that. them. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I love halfling so much. And I'm going to take your advice and maybe start 
apart at some point so I can become more social and more charismatic in a way. <laughs> Um, and yeah. you said that you're currently participating in two D and D campaigns. Um, could you tell us a bit more about your characters and the adventures they're embarking on? Yeah, so like one is the Descent to Avernus, which is the filler campaign. Well, uh, the current dungeon master is on paternity leave, and then uh, and when he comes back, we're doing a homebrew game where I'm playing a druid who has lots of trauma. And playing through that's that, me. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I didn't quite expect her trauma to be what it was, um, <laughs> because her backstory is kind of this power play. Like she uh, was the avatar of a, of a goddess, and then when she finished the job for her goddess, her goddess was like, "Cool, I'm going to put you back to where you started," which was a level one druid. <laughs> so, and then she was instantly put to into a magical sleep by another god, and woke up. Now, like, so her race is a custom race, uh, which is the humanoid common ancestor of all the humanoid races in the world we play in. And so, like, her species doesn't exist anymore. Her language is long dead. Uh, she thought she was on another planet because the stars had moved. And then, like, she had to find out, like, all my... It's basically that kid's book, All My Friends Are Dead, from the dinosaur's perspective. <laughs> it's just like, oh, this is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> where where do you take inspiration from, uh, you know, for your characters and their backstories? It sort of depends. So um, the Dragonborn Bard was just sort of like, I kind of imagined this punk rocker just stereotype of like, Mom, Dad, you don't understand. I'm all about <laughs> punk rock. And like, I, there was just something so metal about a silver Dragonborn Bard. Uh, I, I was just like, yes, this is this is fabulous. I, I love the idea of it. Swashbuckler Rogue was just like reading through the subclasses and I'm like, ooh, this sounds cool. Okay, what story makes sense with this person and how do I make this work? You know, and, and so it's sort of sometimes it's taking inspiration directly from other IPs, but a lot of times for me, it's looking at an interesting class and kind of asking like, how would they, why would this person go out adventure? If, if you're building like a cleric, why are they out in the world? What is it that they're hoping to do? Why didn't they stay in their temple and do good work there? You know, for druids, why are they leaving the grove? Why are they leaving nature and going and exploring other places? A and answering those questions can be really fun and really mm -hmm. fabulous. Do you take inspiration from arts through the internet? Yes. Oh, yes, yes. I love looking. <laughs> uh, actually, that's where my druid character came from. I can't remember the name of the artist, so I'm being a terrible creditor there. But like, I was looking at just old line drawing art. This is, gosh, in the early, early days of the internet, so the early 2000s. And I found this picture of, you know, this beautiful looking woman who just had these haunted eyes. And I was like, oh, I could tell a story about her. Like, what's her story? What's her deal? And that's where that comes from. And yeah, looking at art and just and that's one of the things I love about human created art is that it creates those stories. It creates that, you know, spark of imagination. And like AI art's interesting, but it's not I don't want to tell a story about it. I will look at it and be like, OK. That's the thing. Yeah, <laughs> that yeah, works. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, it seems like our journey into the realms of psychology and D and D has reached its conclusion. A heartfelt thank you to Dr. Megan for sharing your insights and making this conversation truly enlightening. We hope this Thanks. discussion offered a fresh perspective on D and D and maybe sparked a new understanding for our listeners. We certainly learned a lot and we wish you all the best, Dr. Megan, in everything you do. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And if people are interested in learning more or wanting to know where to find me um, I, on all the social media platforms, I'm Megan Sidey, M-E-G-A-N-P-S-Y-D. Also, hqpsych.com for my practice. It's, uh, you can find contact information for me on there as well. And also, you guys, make sure to check her book out. We will leave a link in the description box. It is really fascinating and enlightening. We'll make sure to read it 100%. Thank you. I would also yeah, and like to say thank you. We're so grateful for having you here with us today. It is wonderful and inspiring to see a professional using such pioneering and creative ways of treating mental health issues. We are two advocates of the importance of Dungeons and Dragons in young people's lives, and we cannot thank you enough for your work and your vision. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much for having me. And for the book, too, please be sure if you are an audiobook fan, I pushed really hard to make sure there is an audio version of the book as well. Um, and you can get it from uh, places other than Audible. Um, you can get it through Audible as well, but uh, you can get it through different things as well. And 
Finally, we also thank you guys for joining us today. And until next time, may all your roles be a natural 20. Bye. Bye. Bye.